back, uh, everyone. I uh, hope you had a nice uh, lunch uh, and break to discuss all the great things that were discussed here in the morning. Uh, today, and now we have a couple of fascinating sessions all together, a very ambitious innovation track where we will hear from 12 startups uh, and we will have a great jury to give them feedback and to ask them probing questions. And the jury is uh, Jose Maria from Goodman, Nuria from Biocat, Jordi from La Caixa, Nuria, I said Nadia, sorry, from the Medical Association of Barcelona, David from BBHI, and Cristina from EIT Health Spain. Very diverse, very distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, but the protagonists of this session are going to be the startups and the researchers who have great ideas to solve great and big problems. So we don't want to waste too much time until they come in because we really want to hear from them and discuss things with them. So let's go ahead with a brief video that introduces their work. I'm Isabel van de Kira. I'm the founder and CEO of Immersive Rehab, and we develop digital therapeutics for neurorehabilitation. Hello, my name is Pau, and we're building a company capable to provide universal access and reduce time to treatment for stroke patients worldwide. Hello, my name is Yvonne. I'm part of the team Invictus. Our goal is that no stroke goes undetected. We're going to do this by making use of a mobile application. Good afternoon, my name is Jean-Charles Sanchez and I will present you now the development and commercialization of a new diagnostic test in order to improve the triage of stroke patients in ambulances. Hello, my name is Jordina Arcal and I'm going to present you MJN Setup, the first available device in the market able to predict an epileptic seizure. Hi, I am Alfonso Carnicero from Able Human Motion, and I will present you a solution to walk again after a severe impairment while maintaining a healthy, active life. Excellent. So you can see we're going to have quite a diverse and fascinating session. For each speaker, they will have five minutes, no more, but even one second more to give their wonderful pitch and then we'll have around four minutes for Q&A with the jury. So with no further ado, Isabel from Immersive Rehab, the mic is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, so hello everyone. Thank you for having me uh, today. So uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Immersive Rehab. And um, just one second. I'm just trying to <laughs> move my slides. Yeah, uh, so 10 years ago, I had a severe work accident that basically left me immobile for a very long time. So I went through a long rehabilitation period myself after I had a head injury, neck injury and severe balance issues. Um, so when going through this um, rehabilitation period, I often was very uh, frustrated, demotivated, um, isolated in the way rehab is being done uh, because initially I had a lot of access to rehab, but then gradually, uh, over time, uh, I, I, I had less rehab, but I was not mobile enough to do anything on my own. So I was stuck in my bed at home, uh, isolated. And that's really where uh, a biomedical engineer myself, I started looking into different um, conditions. So spinal injury being one of them, um, stroke, MS, uh, ALS. And when you look at the problem uh, across the world, it is... Um, there are a lot of people dealing with MS diagnos diagnosis on a daily basis, stroke, 17 million people a year have first strokes every year worldwide. And this is only a number that is increasing um, and, and sadly going to double predicted by the World Health Organization by 2030. And of those, for example, stroke patients, uh, more than 50% of people are permanently disabled and they are in need of rehab. The problem today is that a lot of those patients have, um, uh, again, uh, problems to uh, problems with long waiting times, access to rehab, um, 
um, going basically uh, from a non living an independent life essentially to really go through um, go on with their life. And today, COVID obviously has really impacted those. Uh, those the care for those people because of the closure of a lot of their neurorehabilitation centers um so they don't have any ex where before they had a really already a long waiting list to actually access care once for example they were discharged from the hospital now on top of that they actually have no care in a lot of cases or there might be like the odd phone call um where a, a patient where departments are actually uh, trying to set up uh, digital tools for them so it's only gotten worse essentially from the situation pre-covid um so and we've been working for four years now on trying to change the way neurorehabilitation is being approached and really trying to enhance um, and improve patient outcomes because if you look at current neurorehabilitation tools, they're very basic, they're very limited in, in their scope. And they uh, a lot of people just get really frustrated by using those. Uh, so that's what we are trying to tackle is to offer a digital solution where we actually can offer a tool that people are using um, much more frequent. Um, the the um, response and the, the tracking of, of how people are, are progressing as well can enhance patient assessments for clinicians, for example, both in a clinic and in a home setting, where today the data is basically non-existent being collected in a hospital yes on a paper base uh, usually but in a home setting it's very rare that data will be collected and sent back to the clinician so it's very um, critical to their progress uh, going forward so this is one of our solutions where we're it's based on the grasping methods where we're bringing people into a 3d environment completely virtual where we allow people to engage with objects from the very early stages onwards to then progress uh, within their uh, rehabilitation going forward and really enhance their outcomes by having that instant connection with objects and doing really functional movements from a very early stage onwards and keeping it engaging as well. Uh, so personalization is a very big part of our solution, obviously, because every condition is very different um, for every patient. So that's really important that we can uh, personalize our experiences and, and really also implement that uh, telehealth aspect as well so once people get discharged from the hospital or actually are already in a home setting or community setting that we can offer our, our solution there we have done part phase one and phase two trials uh, so far we're currently preparing phase three trials um, that that then will lead essentially to the full deployment in a in a clinical setting and and really then also expand to different markets we're currently working in europe the us and canada to run our um, necessary clinical studies phase three before then getting regulatory approval in all these regions and then expanding to other regions where we already have connections um so yeah thank you so much and i hope you'll join on the journey Thank you so much, Isabel. You've been extremely punctual, even in <laughs> the first seconds were a bit complex, so thank you. And let me ask the first question and then we'll open to anyone in the jury who wants uh, to do that. What or who do you see as your main competitor right now from when this becomes available a few years from now? When, who will be? Yes, uh, so, I mean, there are some, some people working in the space uh, already and they, um, they are kind of focusing on, on, I mean, our main competitors today are obviously uh, those solutions that are coming in the space as well. Um, we are competing obviously with, with current care where um, sadly a lot of the, the budgets are lacking. So it's really, I guess, competing with the budgets in a sense of hospital organizations uh, to really offer the best possible care to patients. Um, and then obviously we are a, so a small number of cost, uh, com like um, companies in the space that are uh, trying to change uh, rehabilitation and really for the benefits of the patients and the clinicians as well. So, um, so yeah. Thank you. Anyone from the jury, what would you like to ask, Maria? Uh, I have a question if possible. <clears throat> I, I would like to, it's a very interesting presentation. I, I'd like to, to know um, a bit more um, about, you mentioned that it can be personalized. Can you uh, elaborate this a bit? Is it uh, related to because of the grasping task gets more difficult depending on the status of the patient or how is it done in general? Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so it will be really about so there will be a level of assessment when patients are uh, coming in, whether they have stroke or MS, 
and this will determine the, the starting point of their exercises. And then obviously when they progress their exercises, it would not make sense that two people, for example, that start with the same base of exercise program, but one person would advance quicker than the other, that they would still have the same program. So it will be essentially on a learning training basis of the system, um, using machine learning essentially that learns from how a patient is evolving and then adapts the program to how the patient is evolving essentially. And this can go, can go quite um, sophisticated in the sense that um, aside from this personalization, there could be predictive aspects coming into the solution as well. Um, that could be really valuable to the clinicians themselves in terms of uh, predicting um, potentially issues around uh, new strokes or some something like that. But this will be looked at in a, in a second stage. But the personalization is very much about a, a learning and training process, yeah. Excellent. Christina, I think you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Isabel, for the, the presentation. I have two questions. Actually, one is more technical. I, I just to understand your solution is, is um, it's going to be used for unsupervised trainings so that, that the patient is at home or you're looking more at a, at a clinical setting as first step, learning how it works. And then on, in the future, you have mentioned some, some elements about telehealth. I just wanted to understand what is your approach in, in the stepwise. And I'll make the second question and let you answer both. Um, in general, neurorehabilitation is, 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 is really a, a topic with great potential, but it's also a difficult business model because mm -hmm. it's different reimbursement in every country. Mm -hmm. And you've put Europe as a bank, uh, US and Canada, but Europe, especially in Europe, validation is completely different one country to another. Um, have you thought about specifically which markets you are targeting and what is your reimbursement model a bit if you can talk? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, coming back to your first question about our sequence, um, we, we, so our main customers are hospitals and clinicians and healthcare professionals, whether they are working in a small practice, big hospital organization. Uh, so the patients will, be, will really transfer on a journey from starting with, a, with, with their clinicians, whether it's their neurologist or their uh, therapist, and then they will move once they know how to use it and they're, they're conf confident using it with their therapist, then they will move, we will move our solution with them in a home setting as well where they, or in a community setting, where they then use it in a home setting with their care, for example, or on their own, but then follow it up remotely with their clinician and therapist. The um, second question about reimbursements is, um, yeah, this is a big issue. And, and I guess it comes back to the, to the, the availability of, of, of funding uh, available and with, for healthcare in countries. And, and yeah, so, so we're very much uh, looking into regions where reimbursement plans for digital tools are being developed and are much more kind of more advanced than in some other countries in Europe, for example, Germany has a digital healthcare act. Um, Belgium, for example, has, has a program, M Health program already as well, and some other countries in Europe as well. So that's um, that's really what, what we're focusing on, and obviously looking into the connections with um, health insurers that also have programs set up, and that the same equals for the US, where you have obviously much more private than and then you have the Medicare system. So, so yeah, that's, that's the hard part. The, the easy part is the technology. The hard part is implementation and reimbursement. So, but we want to be reimbursed. So that's really important for us. So, yeah. And thank you so much, uh, Isabel, Thanks. for your presentation and for the Q&A session. Now we're going to move to the second uh, panel, second pitch. So thank you so much, Isabel. Thank you, bye. And now we are going to hear from Pau in Meetings AI. Pau, are you there? Okay, so okay, imagine this is you. Somebody who you love is suffering a stroke. Time is brain. Every minute until they get the treatment increases the risk that they can talk, walk, or even understand you forever. So you rush them to the hospital and the first thing that they get is a neurological exam and an unconscious CT to discard that then is an hemorrhage. Then they need contrast medical imaging to see if there is a clot and how damages the brain. But there is a problem. More than 50% of the hospitals worldwide don't have access to contrast medical imaging 24 seven. And those who have could reduce time to treatment if they didn't need it. 
So what we've built is an AI software capable to bypass the need of contrast medical imaging and reducing time to treatment from 30 minutes to more than an hour. Remember that every minute, more than 2 million neurons die. Time is brain. And like this, there are 7.2 million people that are diagnosed with stroke every year. With our technology, we can save thousands of lives and disabilities and overcome the huge economic burden for healthcare systems and families. But how does the technology actually work? This is an unconscious image. You cannot see the vascularity of the brain and therefore it's difficult to see if there is a clot and assess how damaged it is. On the contrary, contrast medical imaging show how the blood flows and where it doesn't flow, it's because there is a clot that is occluding it. What we've done is trained an AI software that is able to do the cess assessment with contrast, but without contrast, showing where is located the clot and how damaged is the brain. But not only that, we also provide a communication system that allows to coordinate the different healthcare professionals and hospitals to reduce time to treatment. Our competitors are focused in contrast uh, solutions that are, are not universally available. Some others have tried to work in non-contrast, once focusing in a qualitative understanding of the brain based on the aspect score, others in detecting only specific kinds of clouds. We will be the only company capable to bypass the need of contrast medical imaging by doing a full assessment. And we've proved so by publishing a paper at the American Heart Association. We've done it with a much larger data set with a higher accuracy and considering a wider range of occlusions. And we also won the gold medal at the MRH detection competition of the Radiological Society of North America. Our technology is now being tested real time at a major hospital in Spain. And in the next weeks in several different hospitals in Europe and in the US. We also received a letter of interest and even a grant from senior leadership of medical devices and medical imaging companies. But what about the business model? And here, as you know, Europe is different from the US. Let's consider an average hospital. We consider a price per diagnosis and an average number of patients, which give us an average price per year. And at least we would be able to save four patients. In Europe, health economics, 15K considered as a cost per disability, only saving one patient would be worth investment. Additionally, in the US, they get reimbursed for stroke treatments and they get 28K AK for a, a endovascular treatment. Again, only one patient that could be treated is justifies investment. And last but not least, there is a, a reimbursement only for the use of AI software uh, in stroke. And we will apply for that too. Our go-to-market is focused in three key alternatives, direct sales, channel partners, and licensing to potential competitors. And we've received letters of interest and engaged with the stakeholders in all of these, in all of these uh, categories. We've recently raised 1.8 million to conclude the, the regulatory process. And once we get feedback from the FDA in the pre-submission meeting, we will raise additional 5 million to consolidate sales and then grow with additional 10 million. Our board of director, uh, directors has a proven track record in entrepreneurship, venture capital and software development. And we have very solid investors. We have advisors with a unique understanding of the space and a multidisciplinary team that is focused in the execution and supported by experts that are part-time employees and consultants. To sum up, we have a clear medical need. We have a validated commercial interest. We have a unique technology, but what's most important, we have the best team to make it happen. Thank you very much. Now, everyone in the jury, I'm sure there's many questions, so feel free to jump in. I have a question. <laughs> I would like to ask, Pao, what are the main hurdles you expect before uh, reaching the market? I mean, uh, the key milestone here is from a regulatory perspective. So here we have a clear strategy and, and we are working on a pre-submission meeting, right? So saying to the FDA what we want to work for, this is the main hurdle. 
uh, obviously. Uh, we involved in part of the team Tom Neufelder, who was the former senior vice president of Philips Medical Imaging, who is helping us a lot with the medical, uh, with, with all the regulatory process. And we hired the best consultants in the US to, to overcome this hurdle. But without doubt, uh, proving and, and passing the FDA process is the most challenging. Feel free, anyone in the jury to jump in. We want this to be fun, uh, fast mm -hmm. session. Any other Hi questions, there. comments? So it may have a question. So uh, uh, thank you for the brilliant presentation. It, it's pretty clear they have. Just a naive question probably because I don't know exactly the passion journey in these cases. Uh, what, uh, what is the difference between using, for example, your technology or just treat the patient without a specific diagnosis? That, that's a very, a very good question. Actually, there's some studies trying to do that. So uh, a patient, reaches a hospital and the first thing that they do is an uncontrast. This is a must because they have to discard that there is an hemorrhage because you, that defines whether you do treatment or not. But then you need contrast to see how damaged is the brain and if there is a clot to be able to do the endovascular treatment that consists in removing the clot from the brain. Now there are several studies that try to send the patient directly to the hospital, but here you must, you must be able to have enough good imaging technology, like a cone beam in the, in the hospital to be able to do the treatment. And you can have a lot of false positives too. And you can have tumors, you can have an epilepsy, you can have many other things. So it's not that easy to send a patient to Redmi. Have in mind that three o'clock in the morning, in, depending which region you are in the country, you can struggle a lot. I would say that basic imaging is fundamental and universally accessible. The hurdle here is, if you don't have the chance at three o'clock in the morning in a small hospital for contrast imaging. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Hi, Bao. Uh, this is Nadia Hello, from Nadia. the Medical Association. How are you? Great presentation, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, is there anything else that you can detect uh, with this platform so you can make these results, these numbers even better? Um, yeah, actually, now we, we involved one of the most experts in the world in artificial intelligence. He won multiple uh, Kaggle competitions. So, you know, they are the most competitive AI competitions. And we're doing, evolving the technology a lot. So now we, we're really even improving more the accuracy that we have. Um, people tend to think that the more images you have, the better. And this is true, but there is a plateau. There is a point in which the more images you have is not improving. So what is important is the combination of a solid data set, a good understanding of what you're looking at and the best technology possible. And we have these three pieces very well assembled. Thank you so much, uh, Pau, for your pitch and for the great answers to people's you're questions. Welcome. Now we have to move to the third pitch uh, in this uh, session. We're going to hear from Yvonne uh, at Invictus, great name, by the way. And I think first we'll hear a little video and then Yvonne, the, the mic will be yours. Okay. How can we treat in time when, um, how, so sorry. Um, how can we treat strokes in time when we are not able to detect? It happened to Anna when she, when she was 37 years old that she got a clinical misdiagnosis and it had a huge impact on her life. She went to the emergency department with acute dizziness. She got a CT scan, but nothing risky was shown. She was sent home with a suspected case of a migraine. She didn't know that she got a clinical misdiagnosis. This happens in 37% of similar cases. When she was home, symptoms became worse and she decided to go back to the emergency department again. And this is when they found out she is suffering from a posterior circulation stroke, way too late. Now, Anna has to deal with severe disabilities. She is not able to walk anymore. <clears throat> Her story is not unique. In our world, around 44 million people are visiting the emergency department with dizziness, and 5% of them have an underlying posterior circulation stroke. 
This means that there are millions of people that have to live with the consequences of a clinical diagnosis. Now it is time to act. Did you know that your eyes are the window to the brain and that we can look to the eye movements in, in order to detect posterior circulation stroke? This is already clinical validated. There is already a validated ocular motor examination in place called HINTS, but only the best expert can assess the eye with a high accuracy. It has even a higher accuracy than a CT and an MRI within the first 24 hours. The problem is that not many physicians can perform this eye assessment and they have difficulties doing this because they are not well trained as well. In some cases, as you can see in this movie, it's really difficult to see exactly how the eye is moving. And this is the reason that we are designing BFAST. BFAST recognizes stroke at first sight. It's an artificial intelligence software application supporting physicians to early detect posterior circulation stroke in people with acute dizziness. This will allow our core future is tracking the eye movement with videos. This will allow them to assess the eyes with high accuracy. We will start delivering our solution for the emergency department. So let me show you how it will work for Anna. When she arrived at the emergency department, the physician will take BFAST out of his pocket. He will assess the eyes of Anna, and in a couple of minutes, he knows whether she has a posterior circulation stroke, yes or not. In case of a posterior circulation stroke, he sends the information to the neurologist. This will allow us that we can detect in time to treat in time. We're also going to save costs. Because by limiting the severe disabilities, we're going to save 297 million for the healthcare system. And for the hospital, we're going to save 32K per patient by shortening hospital stay. We're going to make use of a B2B model in which we're going to sell yearly subscriptions to hospitals. This will make sure that every physician has this application on their mobile phone. How are we different than the alternatives? We're going to deliver a solution that detects posterior strokes within 12 hours. It's an easy to use application, low cost, and even more important, no additional hardware needed because everyone has already a mobile phone. So our goal is to make sure that our solution is as quickly as possible in the hand of the physician. This in order to start saving lives soon and it will allow us to start collecting data for our algorithm. So let me show you our roadmap. In the beginning of 2021, we are working on our proof of concept. We're establishing partnerships in order to start conducting pilot studies. So by the end of 2021, we're going to deliver our training tool. In 2022, we're going to start clinical research in which we're going to collect data. This will also allow us to come up with an IP strategy, and in 2024, we're delivering a diagnostic tool. And now it is time to invest. In order to reach our first milestone, we need a pre-seed of 50k. We are Invictus, and together with Maria Isabel, we're leading the project. With two developers, we're going to deliver the proof of concept. We're getting support by clinical and business experts in order to make this happen. So, we are... We, um, well, talking time has passed. For us, just a few minutes. For Anna, lots of brain damage. Let's connect and start saving um, people from the consequences of the misdiagnosis of posterior circulation strokes. Remember, be fast. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for another great uh, idea and solution to a very important problem. And uh, I'm sure we have many questions already from the jury. Anyone can jump in. Hi, Ivana. Uh, um, okay, no problem. Hi, this is uh, Christina Vescos from AD Health. I wanted to ask you about your data collection for your, your start in the initial before the clinical trial. You are looking for an observational trial where you get images, especially for your um, with your mobile application, or is, is there a way to, to get images from databases so that you can already train your, your um, algorithm from, from other sources of, of images? Is there any specificity on, on the images or the videos you need to collect? That's my question. So. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Christina, for the question. Um, in this moment, we don't have like um, videos um, available for clinical diagnosis. So we have now an eye tracking model that we are going to use for the eye tracking. But in order to, in 2024, really to say like, okay, this in posterior circulation stroke, yes or not, we want to do indeed perform it in a clinical context. And we know that there are more research institutions working on eye tracking. So we're also, um, yeah, start reaching out to see if there's collaboration possible. But for now, uh, yeah, our goal is to do it, um, yeah, as part of a clinical research in 2022. Yeah. Yeah, hello, uh, this is Nadia. Um, I would like to ask two questions on the one hand. Uh, where, is all the, where, where does all this data go, is going? I mean, uh, is this uh, data collected in a way that could be um, used within the system that the health system has already had? Or, or which is the, how are you collecting the data? And the other question is, is if um, this detection could be done in distance, I mean, this platform can be, can be used as a telemedicine platform or only in the, uh, where the doctor is, let's say. Yeah, thank you for your question. So regarding your second question, uh, at the beginning, we want to start uh, doing it in hospitals, no? because you need a physician to perform this examination and then to know how to, to hold the head, the head of the patient, etc. But yeah, later, no, uh, after doing this clinical research, no, it could be, we envision that in a future it can be done no? just from your from your home that you can assess your nystagmus, for example, no, and uh, get an answer if it's concerned or not. And then regarding the collect the collection of the data, yeah, you are we are aware that it's important not to 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 have of the all the information that you collect in the in the system. And yeah, but now regarding that we are working on our Proof of concept, it's something that we need to, to, to explore in next steps. How are we gonna manage the, this collection of the data to make the, the pilot study? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Invictus uh, team. Another very interesting solution. And now we're going to move to yet another great uh, pitch. You can see we have quite a rhythm of innovation uh, solutions coming in, in line. Uh, now we're going to hear from Jan Schultz at ABCDX. Jan Schultz, the mic is yours after a brief video. Yes, good afternoon and thank you to give me the floor now. So I will continue effectively in, uh, in the field of stroke and in the diagnostic of stroke. It is really a uh, critical, you know, uh, problem today. And uh, in our case, is really to improve the triage of patients using a, a rapid test in the ambulance. So, so the, just quickly, ABC was founded in 2014 with uh, uh, my co-founder, Juan Montagnier from the Valdebron uh, Hospital. We raised 2.2 million in equity uh, in investment and 12 million in non dilutive funds. We built, you know, a portfolio of more than 10 patents that some are granted, some are issues or, or pending. And for Abyssalix, we already analyzed thousands of patients or stroke patients and published uh, several papers to show the, the results. So probably that just don't want to repeat too much, you know, what has been just said about a stroke, uh, 15 million per year at least, and there's two, two subtypes, hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke. 80% are ischemic. Something that is really critical, as we have seen in the previous uh, presentation, is to, to differentiate between an hemorrhagic and a clogging of a vessel. So rupture with, the, you know, the treatment is either surgical therapies or just looking at the patient. Or in ischemic stroke, the treatment has to be within, given within four hours. And the treatment will depend on the type of, of stroke, of ischemic stroke. One, it is thrombectomy, if it is when it is possible, with, when it is large vessel occlusions, or thrombolysis for the rest of the, of the ischemic strokes. The timing is really key. And, um, and usually, you know, the no door to needle 
can take from two to nine hours. And depending on the way he's located the patient with a stroke. So from a, from a suspected stroke from the ambulance, you are brought to a, a, the nearest hospital and uh, where there's a CT scan with differentiating these different subtypes of, of strokes. And when it is even a large uh, vessel occlusion, many times you need to transport again the patient in a large uh, central medical service where thrombectomy is performed. There's not many places, many hospitals where you can perform this thrombectomy. So all this brings that there are very small number of ischemic stroke patients that receive reperfusion therapies. It's less than 15 to 20% of the patients. So what we propose in ABA6, so it's a, a diagnostic rapid triage of patients in the ambulance. So when you arrive to the, to the patient home is to take a blood, um, a drop of blood put in a small rapid test in 10 minutes, you have the answer and you can stratify the patient within the different subtype of stroke. So if it is hemorrhagic ischemic going to the, the nearest hospital to give very quickly, you know, thrombolysis or to send directly to the central um, hospital where NGO CT can be performed and, and, and thrombectomy. So our studies, Prospective studies in the ambulances have shown that we have a gain of one to three hours from door to needle. So here just the results of our uh, two retro last retro retrospective studies here, and one prospective study in ambulances in all Andalusia that has been just ended, where you can see that we can have 100% specificity and 70% sensitivity. So that means that seven out of 10 patients we can uh, do a triage with very high certainty. So here the proposition clearly it's as in other, uh, with other tests is really to have an earlier treatment of patients. And there's a, uh, you know, a concept of the golden hour. So if we can gain one hour, it means that you can uh, uh, increase two times uh, to become asymptomatic, three times to stay independent and you increase four times the survival rate of, of patients. In addition, as you, you may imagine, the cost savings for this type of disease is huge. And it is supposed that each patient that is treated, you, you, you have a decreased cost of more than 20,000 euro uh, for, the, for this patient. So we did several cost utility models depending on the countries. And we can, the, the, the price of this test will be from 250 to 500 uh, dollars per test, knowing that the, the cogs will be around five euros. So it's just the, the milestones, the roadmap. So we, we ended all these steps on the R&D clinical studies and product development. We are finalizing this and uh, we are just starting all the different steps for the regulatory um, um, adoption of the product in the States and in Europe. And so we expect to start the conversation in Europe um, mid to end of this year and the US in 2022. In so the business models, so, so as you can imagine, it represents a huge commercial opportunity to more than 2 million uh, of market size. So our revenue in ABCDX, and it is a relative, you know, in percentage, so it's based on three pillars. So at the early revenues will be through the sales of our consumables, the antibodies directed to our proprietary um, uh, biomarkers. And also, so the, the margin on the sales, on the instruments and the rapid tests that we have developed. And, but then with the time it will evolves and we have, our goal, final goal is really to increase your, the revenue through the, uh, the license and the sus subscription base, you know, income and continuing then with uh, the consumables and the margin on the distribution. So we are targeting a revenue of 60 million in 2025, a break even in 23, and a detail of 35 to 40% by 2025. So we have a. a, a yeah, large yeah, Charles, sorry, yes? this other, you need to wrap up already. Is there five yes, minutes? It's the end. It's the end. Right. Yeah, so here, here our, our, our board of directors and team management with a lot of experience. And so here is the, the, really the end. So we are emerging as a world leader in early stroke. Uh, diagnostic in ambulance. Uh, we have no competition actually in ambulances themselves. And so we are just starting a, a, um, a financing round of five to 10 million. Thank you.
thank you so much for a great uh, overview. And uh, as before, Yuri, feel free to jump in with great uh, questions yes. and comments. Um, my, I have a question regarding the, the relation between the, the 60% or 70% of sensibility it is uh, and 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 the cost of of um, of two hundred and fifty or or five hundred uh, dollars euros in in for for tests. I mean, um, do you think that that it sustained really um, having a a, a a a a proportion of of thirty percent of of false uh, negatives? If if this could be really um, Helpful in 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 in, in adding um, a value to the to the actual state of the of the diagnosis of the stroke. So the the quickly the the actual diagnosis of stroke is done in the hospital. Here, what we propose is to do a diagnosis pre-hospital, really at the really uh, as soon as possible after the stroke uh, onset. So when we have 70% of sensitivity for 100% specificity. That means that seven out of 10 ischemic stroke patients could have been treated already in the ambulance. The, the rest, the 30% false negatives, is not that false negatives, is that we don't know if it is ischemic hemorrhagic, so we don't treat them in the ambulance, for example. And so then they follow the classical workflow up to the hospital and you have a CT scan on these patients where you, are, you don't know, where you are not sure what type of, of triage. On the question of cost, so we, we did several cost utility studies because that's something really, really key, you know, for to enter in, in the market. Each country will be different. And then, you know, there will be many discussions also with the insurances for the reimbursement. But clearly the cost utility even shows that a 700 uh, US dollar will be still, you know, uh, in, in the range of the cost utility. But probably, you know, the prices will be lower than that um, in order to have a, a, an entrance, you know, in, and a, a good penetration in the, in the market. Excellent. I have time for one more question. If someone from the jury has a question. I would like well, to ask, oh, ahead, sorry, yeah. sorry. Anna. No, go ahead, please. No, no, Nuria, yours. I would like to ask if there are, there are other technologies point of care similar to yours in the market nowadays, and if yes, how does it make a difference from those? So in uh, a similar um, diagnostic test uh, is on the market and is developed by us, uh, and it is for traumatic brain injury where you, you know that is very similar because you can have an hemorrhagia. So, and it's called TBI check instead of stroke check. Um, there is no, on stroke, there is no competitors. They know nobody has uh, any diagnostic test. The only thing that exists now to try to, to, to triage is, uh, is race, is a score that has been developed in Barcelona, in Catalonia. And, uh, but they just demonstrated uh, one month ago in the World Stroke Congress that the race finally doesn't work. And so there's nothing, EEG, it cannot be used. CT scan cannot be used, it's too expensive. That would be the ideal is to have a CT scan in the ambulance, but this is largely too expensive for that. So there's actually, we don't have any competitor. Thank you so much, uh, John Charles. Fascinating approach. Uh, and now we're going to hear another great uh, innovation and approach from uh, Jordina at uh, MJN. A uh, brief video, and then Jordina, the mic is yours. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jordina Arcal, and I am the CSO of MJN. MJN is born from a very personal project. Our founder, David, has a daughter, Marina who's been suffering from epilepsy for more than 16 years. And like Marina, there are between 60 and 100 million people all over the world suffering from epilepsy. Epilepsy affects the 3% of the total healthcare budget. This is 10 times China's GDP. And epilepsy is associated to unpredictability. It comes from the Greek word meaning surprise attack. So 
people suffering from epilepsy, they are also suffering from accidents, meaning they are suffering from injuries, and it's also related to anxiety and stress. Their quality of life is very poor, and they cannot carry day-to-day -day activities that we consider normal, such as cooking or running, for example. For them, we have created MJM Saras. MJM Saras is the first available device in the market that is able to predict an epileptic seizure. So as you can see, it is a portable and discrete device that it acts like an EEG. It constantly tracks the electric brain activity through the ear canal and it's connected to the mobile phone. So it constantly says to the patients if they are in a low, medium or high risk of suffering a seizure. So when it comes to high risk, it alerts them and they can put themselves in a safe position. So as you can see, the technology is composed by the earpiece, which is personalized for each patient as a portable EEG, two-channel EEG, and it is connected to a mobile phone where we embed a personalized artificial intelligence algorithm, which is able to assess within one minute if a patient is gonna suffer a seizure or not. So it can alert them, and with that, we can reduce accidents. We can reduce emergencies and deaths, but we can also impact on the emotional impact of the illness, reducing anxiety and depression. Therefore, we can also act in the economic impact of the illness, reduce, reducing the costs associated to these accidents. Moreover, we can also provide information, valuable information to neurologists to better treat the illness. Of course, there are many devices available in the market that are dealing with epilepsy. But as you can see in this table, most of them are only for detecting. We are the only available device in the market that is able to predict an epileptic seizure. For example, the device with the largest market penetration, which is Embrace from Empatica, it's a wrist that it only detects movement when the seizure starts. So, their accuracy is not as good as ours because we can read the electric brain activity and they are not able to predict the seizure and alert from it in advance. We've done there that thanks to our amazing team composed by three co-founders with the fields of engineering and economy and 17 people that are covering all the areas needed to make the project a success software, marketing, financial, business development, quality and strategy. And we are also very supported by advisors and a clinical research committee advising us on the fields of neurology, data analysis, clinics, and legal. We've achieved more than 3.4 million euros. We've obtained the ISO as medical device and patented our device and protected our algorithms. We've also done the clinical trials demonstrating that our technology is working and their benefits, and we've obtained the C mark as class 2A medical device. So we have started our sales this month in Spain. We've been also recognized all over the world as one of the best medical devices, as one of the best IoT technologies, and as one of the best social companies. And our aim is to ramp up our curve, our sales curve, to end up in 2025 with 40,000 units in the market. Now we have started in Spain and we have an agreement in the Netherlands that we will, they will start sales very soon. And next year we will enter Germany, UK and France, ending in 2022 in the USA, where we have already started the FDA procedure. The sales will be directly to users, with a price of 1,450 euros plus taxes, and then they will get a 300 euro uh, um, uh, fee for obtaining improvements of the algorithms and also data for the neurologists. So now we are raising 4 million euros to ramp up the sales curve in Europe, where we already have pre-agreements in the UK and also in Germany and to enter the US market where we already have contacts with manufacturers 
and also clinics to overcome all the procedures needed to enter this market. So just to end, I want to remind you the importance of our project. Here, you can see Alex. Alex now is suffering an epilepsy seizure. He has to wear a helmet to go to school. Can you imagine him going to school without this helmet? Can you imagine him having a normal life? This could be possible thanks to MJ and Sarah's. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jordina. And I do have a quick question before the jury comes in, because that strategy to sell both to consumers directly and also through clinics, sometimes it's complex to do both, and even the price point to make sure these both channels are happy. So how are you thinking about that price point, which seems pretty high from the consumer side, and how to manage those two channels? So uh, in the countries where we, where we can, we will be reimbursed, so we will use the reimbursement part, then we will sell it directly to the, um, to the medical services. But in the countries where we cannot be reimbursed, we will sell directly to consumers through specialized uh, distributors. So it's easy to maintain both lines because there are many countries where epilepsy devices, they are not reimbursed. So people suffering from epilepsy, they are used to buy these devices. And what we do to overcome this price barrier is give them some facilities to obtain the device. For example, financing it without any commission or putting a starting price a little bit lower and then a mandatory subscription fee. So it's type of financing the device. So there are many strategies that we are using for everyone to obtain the device. Thank you. Now anyone in the jury can ask, jump in. Yeah, hello. Um, very clear presentation, Sardina. Thank you. I would like to ask for the battery life and if you think that this could be a, a market barrier and if you can comment also on other market barriers that you have uh, found. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. The battery life, it can last up to two days, but we always recommend, as they do with your mobile phone, that you charge it every night. So it's a device thought to be used during day. For night, there are other devices that are suitable that you put uh, down your blanket. And we recommend it to charge it every night and it will for sure last the whole day because it's been able to last two days. So this is not the, the barrier. The main barrier we are having is the novelty of the product. So since there are no products that are able to predict seizures, we have a little bit of, of people thinking that it may not work in real life, even though we have published the results of our clinical trials, we have demonstrated, we have to keep track on the market and we have to get as much testimonials as we can to to demonstrate that the device is working and that it can improve their quality of life. I have a, one question. Thank you for the presentation. I, just to clarify, is it is your algorithm be, being able to predict the onset of seizures of any type of epilepsy? Because it seems from the videos that it's a specific type for children, but there are all different kinds. So it wasn't perhaps clear to me. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It cannot predict all types of epilepsy. It's only useful for that types of epilepsy that are producing electric brain activity. So if you know about epilepsy, you may know that there are types of epilepsy that the seizures are not producing electric brain activity. So sadly that ones we cannot detect them as we are using a two channel EEG through the e-canal and the other types of epilepsy we cannot predict are the ones that come from very inside of the brain because they are very far from the ear canal. The signal is very weak for us. So we are not able to use the dev our device for that type of seizures. But it's for, for young, uh, young people and also for adults. It's not only for young people. The video was with Marina, which is David's daughter, which is our, our motto. So that's why it's shown Marina on there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jordina, for your answers and your overview and your work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to hear uh, about uh, what uh, Able, uh, let me see the free name, uh, Able Human Motion, uh, we will hear from Alphonse after a brief video.
Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alfonso Carnicero, and I will present our Barcelona-based company, Able Human Motion. This is how they see the fridge. This is what they see when they take the subway. Because there are 2.7 million people worldwide with difficulties to move. From those, 0.1 million need a wheelchair to move around. The most common causes of disability are spinal cord injury and stroke. These devastating injuries involve health complications such as cardiovascular and digestive problems. They generate psychological consequences such as depression, careless, carelessness, and a low self-esteem, and increase dependency on activities of daily living. All this restricts their particip participation in society and represents high economic costs and a decrease in their quality of life. People with mobility impairments could, could regain mobility and could walk again if they had a robotic exoskeleton to restore the leg movements that were damaged due to the injury. However, current technology is very expensive as it costs about 100,000 euros. It's very heavy and requires professional supervision. Therefore, it is only found in large hospitals and is out of the reach of the patient. This is why we present ABLE, the first lightweight, easy to use and affordable solution for them. With only nine kilograms, it will become the lightest exoskeleton in the market due to the use of advanced materials and a delicate design. It's easy to use with the most advanced robotics and motion control techniques and affordable seeking home use. In this video, in this video, you can see Ricard, who suffered a, spine, a complete spinal cord injury at T10 vertebra and is paralyzed from the waist down, so completely paralyzed below the hip. The able exoskeleton is the first device that allows him to stand up and to walk again on their own with a natural gait pattern. The unique features that make ABLE stand out are that the end users have been actively involved since the very beginning to provide their feedback during the whole development process. It seeks to promote the autonomy and empowerment of the user in their own rehabilitation process. Also, the intention to initiate each of, of the steps is detected with a patented system that interprets the user preserved motion. This allows patients to feel that they are the ones making the steps and not the machine. And finally, it is composed of five modular snap-together components that offer quick put on and take off, easy transportation and storage. The exoskeleton is also accompanied by able care a cloud-based mobile app to enhance the rehabilitation experience, enabling a more personalized therapy with real-time adjustments and quantifiable metrics. ABLE is a unique solution for patients who will be able to continue their rehabilitation when they leave the hospital. Also for clinical professionals offering more intensive and repetitive training, which together with early mobility lead to a faster recovery. And finally, for hospital administrators, as it improves the efficiency of therapies and reduces readmissions. The main competitors of the market uh, for ABLE are Exobionics, Rewalk, Indego, and Cyberdyne. The cost of these devices runs from 80,000 to 150,000 and weight from 14 to 23 kilograms. We have managed to drastically lower down the cost and weight of this technology which will allow a much faster penetration in the domestic market. ABLE will be first introduced in clinical institutions to generate clinical evidence and engage key opinion leaders in rehabilitation. After that, and after a clinician recommendation, ABLE will be commercialized to end, to end users for daily use at home. In just two years, we turn a prototype into an industrial product that has been tested successfully in 15 para paraplegic individuals. We have also validated the market with more than 150 interviews and obtained letters of intent from 10 internationally renowned clinical institutions and six distributors. We have a worldwide patent in national phases 
and just filed a second patent. We are also implementing a quality management system according to the ISO standard for medical devices and are currently undergoing a clinical, uh, a multicentric clinical study in two leading hospitals in Germany and Spain. The Heidelberg University Hospital and Alf Institute Alf Alf Yes. Sorry, you need to wrap up. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, our team is, uh, we have a multidisciplinary and passionate team that is led by Anna, and Alex, Jose Maria, Juan, Pau and me, who have a broad experience in engineering, robotics, clinical applications, quality and regulatory. And uh, so far the project has received several recognitions as the best robotics startup in Europe by EU Robotics and the best healthcare startup by Catalonia Radio. So I would like to end my presentation with this sentence that uh, Ramon, a music lover, told us that was that he would love to go to a concert and see the stage again. So let's make this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alphonse. And frankly, these days, that's the dream of all of us, right? To, to be able to go and enjoy a live concert uh, again. Uh, questions? Jerry, jump in. Yes, uh, uh, Alphonse, um, you are uh, you are telling that that your ambition is, or at least what you have two, two scenarios is hospital and, and home. Uh, for, the, for the potential of, of use of the, of the device, do you also ambition to use out at home? I mean, to use it at the, at the society or, or, or is just uh, uh, something to, to, to continue the rehabilitation at home? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our our mission and, and, and our our vision for, for the future is that we will see this, that these devices, exoskeletons, are in the early stage of development, and and we will be able to see this technology not only at home, but also outside. So we we aim to provide in a in a five to ten years frame uh, technology uh, for individuals to walk in the street, to go to the supermarket, and to do daily life uh, activities, and 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 and. All I showed was only this first product that is for people with spinal cord injury, but we are also developing other kinds of products. For example, we're developing an exoskeleton for a stroke population that uh, will also uh, look forward for, for this assistance. So uh, outside the hospital, be able to assist the individual in, in their daily tasks. Hi, Alphonse. Very, very good presentation. I have a, a question related to your, your competitive advantage. I mean, it's clear that, that your proposition uh, shows a lighter and, and flexible um, exoskeleton, but I, I understand your competitors are going to into those directions as well. So can you quantify, I mean, the, the months or years of advantage that you have from them in order to, to see what, what is your really your advantage in the market? Yeah, our, our advantage came from putting the center, uh, the, the user in the center of, of the innovation. So we, we clearly understood what was relevant for, for the patient and, and we developed a technology that, that is, is useful for them. And this is why our, our exoskeletons are so different from our competitors, not only in terms of price and weight, but also in terms of experience. Because the experience of using uh, one uh, exoskeleton from the competitors is, is like being inside a vehicle that works for you. And the experience of uh, fitting inside an able exoskeleton is that you are the one that are commanding each of the steps. And this is very different. Okay, and, and this has been developed through many years. Uh, there is uh, a lot of people that have been involved in this. We started in the in the UPC, in the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, and, and now in the company. And and with this clear of user focus, we are we are developing the following product. So I would say that that we are one step ahead uh, from 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 the main competitors, but to to keep this advantage, we will also need uh, support as we had, for example, from, from EIT Health, but support from big, from lead uh, industry partners to, to bring this to, to, the, to the mass population. We have time for one quick question, if anyone has one, or I will jump in. Okay, so let me, Alphonse. So given what you just said, given that unique capability, 
uh, that you have uniquely in your device, would you ever try to license that maybe to other devices and to create like a platform? Or do you see that a proprietary thing that could only work as part of your own device? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And in fact, we are, we are using it as a platform. So uh, all I showed was this first device that is going to touch the market, but uh, we're using this concept as a platform. So we have a, 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 core, a core technology that can be then uh, applied to several uh, application use cases. No? The second one is a stroke that we, for example, receive the support from La Caixa Foundation also uh, to, to further develop this technology and, and, and apply it for stroke hemiplegic patients but also for other kinds, for example, for the elderly population to assist in their, in their daily life, to, to allow them to be more active uh, for longer periods. No? We, 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 we may use this same core technology for, for them and, and later on, even though for, for, for example, sports and, and other kinds of uh, applications so the, and industrial applications. Uh, the, the, the number of applications is huge. We started focused in the to solve the, the the biggest problem that is the people that cannot move but then we want to expand using by using the same technology thank you thank you so much alphonse uh, so we have heard from six different great approaches trying to address specific conditions that could be helpful in other areas but they start very well focused on one uh, and this is the first part of today's innovation track and from the six, we're going to select, well, in fact, you, the audience, is going to select uh, one that you think is more impressive or more promising, any criteria you want, but who you would like to vote for. We're going to watch some little videos for each to remind us who they are and what they are working on. And then the audience will have the chance to vote. And then we will announce one winner for this uh, part of the session. The winner will get 500 euros. The most important thing is the recognition of having uh, deserved the award today, and also two sessions with a number of market experts and scientists to help you develop further the idea. So if now the producers can play quickly that uh, video and open the voting poll afterwards, that would be excellent. Our vision is really to change the way uh, rehabilitation is being done and to, through our digital therapies we um, aim to help and improve patient outcomes um, for people with neurological conditions, help enhance patient assessments and, uh, and really by offering our solution quicker to patients, we can help also reduce waiting times and referral times to access um, the necessary care that patients need. Our technology will disrupt the stroke space. We have a clear medical need, a strong commercial interest, a unique technology, but what's most important, the best team to make it happen. Thank you very much. Remember, be fast. We need to start assessing the eyes of the patient in order to ensure that no stroke goes undetected. And feel free to reach out if you want to innovate in the field of stroke diagnostic with us. And I hope that this uh, speech has convinced you that stroke check will dramatically accelerate the triage of patients in the ambulance. Remember, MJ and Saras is the first available device in the market able to predict an epileptic seizure and improve epilepsy affected people's quality of life. Join us on the mission to turn disability into ability by empowering every person in a wheelchair. Yes, we able. So let's close the poll and then organization can tell us what the results are, please. They're trying to create suspense, you know? Everyone handle stress, please. Okay, I see some movement there. I see a video. And I think after the video come the results. So please stay around.
to my mom's name. So Alphonse, congratulations for the great beats and the great work you are working on. And hopefully everything goes very well and can help you be even more successful commercializing everything. Thank you very much. I don't know. Oh, I, I was wait expected. A to... Okay. Wait, wait a second, Alphonse. I th I'm not sure if they want now to present some results in a different format. Alphonse, in any case, congratulations. This has been a fantastic uh, session, and the audience has chosen to vote for the great work you are working on. Maybe that idea of everyone going to a concert <laughs> has has resonated with people. Absolutely. Th thank you very much. It's a it's a huge honor uh, to to receive this this award, and and we really look forward to having our technology uh, available in hospi in hospitals such as the one in Institute Goodman, where we are currently doing the, the clinical evaluation of, of our product, but but more in, into the into the clinical practice of, of every day and, and and later on 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 the streets and, and everyday life so, to help these patients. So thank you very much to, to all the organizers and to everyone that has voted because it's a real pleasure since all the, the other products, I, I, I knew uh, some of them very closely and, and I are fantastic projects. So thank you very much. Excellent. And you know that now, again, the organization will follow up with you in terms of the recognition and the check and the two hours of mentoring. A number of experts are going to help you and your team. Hopefully that will be useful and I'm sure the producers will be able to share later maybe the numbers so everyone knows how people voted. Uh, thank you so much and I think this wraps up the first part of the innovation track for solutions for specific uh, conditions and we're going to now watch a couple of videos if I understand to create like a little break and to have fresh lines in just three four minutes for the second part of the innovation track, which is more focused on general platforms that can be used for brain health or mental health as a whole. So please stay around or take a little, 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 very short uh, break and we will be back in three, four minutes for the second track. Thank you everyone. <laughs> 